Welcome to The Fix. Sit down with copywriting experts Nick O'Connor and Glenn Fisher as they review, discuss and improve real-world copy sent in by you. This is The Fix. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Fix. Uh, as you can see and will be able to hear very shortly, I am not joined by Nick. I am joined by the wonderful Beth slash Bethany slash other words that begin with B, but not nasty ones. Um, we were just talking before we came on camera whether Bethany goes by the word Bethany or Beth. Um, Beth, it's Beth. It's anything. You're happy with anything. Um, you know, it should be ideally related to my actual name, but yes. <laughs> so we're, we're, um, we were talking about it because I did think um, and, and Beth mentioned it that for her own branding, she should think about should it be Bethany? She's the website is it bethanyjoy.com or yeah? Uh, .com. Yeah. 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 And and it's it looks nice, it's all designed beautifully. It's a fantastic website, which is um kudos by the way. And it goes sideways, which is pretty cool. Um yeah. anyway, you think about that because you are a brand voice strategist and today's episode is all going to be about talking about brand voice now i'm aware that some copywriters will be absolutely on board with um the idea of a brands and what have you um and that what have you speak volumes but um some people will be like yep yeah, brand voice very important you've got to spend all this time thinking about it doing it uh, other people will be like yeah whatever it's just a thing it's just one of those hairy fairy things that we don't really uh need to think about we just write copy and that's that's the copy we write i'm interested in that and i'd like to explore um while we've got bethany here i've, I've just realized i'm going from bethany to beth and back again each time we'll, we'll find a consistency by the end of the end of the episode uh, but i'd like to explore that whole idea of it being a load of nonsense head on and figure out a what is it uh, from someone who works in it all the time um B, why do we need it? Um, and C, what can you do about it? A, as a copywriter, if it's something that you're not particularly aware of. Uh, but B, if you are, uh, once you kind of get and see how it can help you uh, in terms of copywriting, um, how you can maybe go to clients who aren't um, au fait with this kind of stuff and help them better understand their brand uh, voice. So that's my big old preamble or pre-ramble. Uh, Beth, Maybe if we just start just to set the scene with how you became a brand voice strategist. You used to be a copywriter, but when we were talking, you, that it's not something you think is of yourself as a copywriter anymore. Um, you've kind of evolved uh, from that in a, in a certain way. How did you get into this space? Uh, what made you specialize in this? Uh, perhaps give it a little pricey of all that. Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, I definitely didn't sort of set out to do it I think certainly when I started I mean my whole career has been in various comms and marketing roles and I in the early part of my career I wouldn't really have recognized brand voice tone of voice verbal identity that it wasn't particularly common and I wouldn't really have recognized it as something so I never really set out to do it but I like I said always done comms and marketing stuff and always had a big emphasis on writing and really loved writing and so in the second half of my career I became first a copywriter for a agency a digital agency and then went freelance um, and so it kind of grew out of that because I just found and I know lots of people will uh, recognize this when they hear I just found that I got when I was getting hired to you know write website copy or blog copy or product copy or whatever it was you know when we were kind of going through the briefing process obviously one of my questions was not just what do we need to say who's the audience message all that kind of stuff but I was always saying what you know how how do you want me to write it? How do you want to sound? What's what's your sort of organisational identity and tone and style? Um, and although, well, I could probably think of like one client that knew the answer to that and actually had any kind of um, guidance on that. Mostly they just didn't, they didn't know. Um, some of them didn't even really quite understand what I was asking. Um, and even the ones who sort of got it were like, oh, just, you know, professional, but friendly. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. like across the board, professional but friendly. Um, and so I, I think that just for whatever reason that just really caught at me that I just kind of felt like 
but I'm just right like that could mean anything you know and obviously I would do my best to look at their existing stuff and kind of make my best guess and whatever but it it just always left me feeling like I hadn't quite done the job in the way that I wanted to and you know obviously I could sort of make their copy better in some generic sense but I, I felt like I wasn't quite serving them as fully as I could and so you know longer story out of that but basically that's how it kind of developed I just took an interest in that particular um yeah. aspect of the writing process and then have just sort of developed it from there and do, do you find then that since then and we'll jump about a little bit but it, I think it's interesting to understand so you you kind of it naturally evolved you, you're doing content and, and copy for um various companies and you, you're seeing this same thing over and over again that they're missing this little element and you've gone into that did you do you find that people come to you now more often have you have you seen it change that more companies are aware of of brand voice stuff these days has it what what's that kind of how has that evolved in the marketplace or are you still having to go into companies what makes like people come to you and say oh actually yeah we admit we've got a problem or is it people don't know and they kind of are surprised by it how does that work um I think it's a mix I mean I think overall there is more like industry wise there's more awareness I think as people have moved on from the idea of brand being a logo you know as people's understanding of of visual identity and the bigger picture of brand has evolved I think people have begun to understand more that that obviously also has a verbal aspect yeah and so just about how you look it's about how you sound and how you come across so I naturally I think awareness of that has grown um there definitely is still an education piece but the, I suppose the only thing I would say is that I think now for various reasons just the particular area I'm in and maybe the experience that I've got and the clients that I tend to work with I I don't actually do very much kind of outbound like I I get a lot of my stuff from referrals or like companies who are already in the middle of working on a wider sort of mainly visual rebrand and then they realize that the tone of voice stuff is kind of part of that and so thankfully now on a personal level I actually don't hardly ever have to do the education piece people are coming to me already yeah. convinced of the importance of it and that, that that's why they're coming to me um so personally I don't have to but yeah I do I do think the education piece is still massive um there are a few companies who get it but i think there are still loads and loads and loads that don't exactly yeah i, I would tend to agree from my own personal experience of that um you, you mentioned something there about the idea that um when it comes to like educating people and um clients will come and they come to you going oh we've done all the branding we've got the visuals we've got the design it all looks the part it's all cool we just need some words to go into this space uh, and that kind of frustration is like a last minute thing of like, oh, here we go. This is just the words. They're kind of by the by. And it's like, what? what? And you're left in that position as I have it as copywriter, like filling the gaps going, OK, yeah. so what's what's the idea? And they're going, well, the idea is this. And going, well, in that case, your words can only say this kind of thing. And it, it kind of yeah. precludes a lot of what you can write. How how have, what's your... I guess this come you can answer this however you like, but do you see that is still a major problem? And B, if it if it is, which I think it probably is, how how do you overcome that? Um, do you like work earlier with try and work early with clients, get that that kind of that education going? Do you have any advice for, from your experience of how you've overcome that problem because it is a major problem? I, well, I think it's always a bit mixed as in diff different clients come in different stages uh and yes it is very frustrating and in all honesty this isn't particularly helpful but for some clients if they come and it's really clear that their attitude is kind of we we sort of need something with the words but we haven't got much time we haven't got much money and we just basically we have some latin text at the moment and we need you to make it nicer than latin text, and that's kind of all they're prepared to give to it then normally i actually just say no <laughs> um because I think it's not the right they're not going to get the best out of me I'm not going to serve them you know so that's not very helpful but sometimes I well you, like you say that but with, there's a permission giving thing there that you can you can yeah, just say no yeah things. exactly it's, too, it's, too, it's too often we uh we we take especially copywriters and I see it all the time you take on the work and you go yeah okay I'll take that for the thing but you end up in a yeah. position where you, you you're not going to deliver something 
well, whatever you deliver can't meet their expectations, the client's expectations. So therefore, they're going to be upset because they didn't know what they wanted. So you're not delivering good work. They're not going to employ you again and all this kind of, it, it might be better to like be strong in yourself and say, no, that's yeah. not for me. Here's why. And if you want the help, yeah. you can just shout. But yeah, so it's, it's definitely yeah. right. Yeah, and it, and I I also recognise that there's a privilege of being like a more experienced copywriter and have you know I'm in a position where I can say no to work and that's not true of everyone and so I don't want to be glib about that but I think it's quite important to know what the red flags are and obviously I, I don't normally just say no flat out but you have a bit of a conversation and you push and I think you you just l- learn really how whether there's they can be educated a bit and whether there's flex or whether they just are like no this is the, this is what I need this parameters and you think well I can't I can't help you I can't give you what you want so sometimes it's it's a no but uh, otherwise I think I I just sort of talk to them and try and explain the process that I would normally go through and basically say to them that you know this is what I would normally do and these are the reasons why I do it in this way So if you want to get the best out of it, I suggest that we make room for this entire process. Um, And it's just to do with whether they're on board with that or not. So I've definitely had some clients where they've they've been in the middle of a sort of wider rebrand, particularly with a focus on the visual stuff. And actually they've they've kind of paused that so that we can almost go back a few steps and really do some work around the organizational identity and personality. And it depends what agency or freelancer they've been working with on the visual identity whether that work's already been done or you know so it's it's really bespoke to each situation but I definitely have had clients where yeah where they can be convinced to slightly move the parameters and to make space for that um I think it's just having a really clear understanding a really solid case for this is what I do and these are the reasons why I do it so it's not me sort of being bullshy or kind of saying I want more money or my stuff's the most important it's just about laying out this is what happens and these these are the reasons why we do it and so if you think that's important then let's make space for that and if you don't think that's important then probably I'm not the right person to work with so that's sure. you know. And without, without putting you on the spot I'm making you have to uh, go through your entire process but what are the the kind of the the main drivers what when you when you're going to a client saying this is this is what we aim to do and why what just at, at very top level what's the kind of top three things if you like that you if, with an ideal client you go this is what we're looking to do here's why uh, and here's what we do about that how would you go through that um i think probably the the biggest piece that that a lot of people, even if they're bought into the work and see its value, maybe don't totally appreciate, is that it's actually, it's obviously all about the words ultimately, but it's actually not about the words in the beginning. Um, You've got to have a foundation from the words to spring from. You know, if you want to develop an organizational language that has to to spring from something, to come from something, and it, it, it needs to spring from a really clear sense of the organizational personality really what what the heart and the DNA of that organization is like. And I usually find that most organizations haven't really done that work or certainly haven't articulated that. So most organizations will have like a mission or vision and kind of values, organizational values. And I mean, that's a whole nother kettle of fish. Like they're all the same and they're kind of bullshit and whatever. But um, even best best intentions, you know, they've got a really great set of organizational values or whatever. They, I think people... Um, there's a bit of work to be done on people understanding that you have to go deeper than that you know loads of different people could all share the same values but outwork them in a very different way have a very different personality a very different sort of style and tone so there's that initial kind of piece of work of just mining the organizational identity to really pull that stuff to the fore because that's what you're basing it on rather than jumping straight to I think a lot of people think like can you just write some nice words for us almost like can you just make up a voice for us and I'm always trying to say it's not it's not about that I'm I'm here to help you sort of unearth and uncover what your organizational language needs to be. How, how do you how do you to deep dive into that how do you go about uncovering that because I, I know exactly what you mean you've got that those values those things which everybody I, there was a I don't know a decade or a few years where everybody just produced these values that everybody had and that's the kind of there we go that plus um the word in like friendly and professional that's your tone of voice guide and it's like no no that's not how it works how do you what do you what are you looking for to to pull out 
um, to like make that more of a, a meaningful uh, experience for you to then create the words, to create the copy, to create the, the stuff that comes after. Um, so I guess just in terms of my process, and I, th I think there would be different ways to do it. And you know, I know a few other like brand voice specialists and consultants, sure. and I get everyone probably does it slightly differently, but I think I, I tend to spend quite a, a long time in a sort of audit phase of just trying to get as familiar as I can with an organization. So I will try and, and read sort of almost everything that they've written ever, <laughs> um, go through all of their different comms and look at some internal stuff and external stuff and just try and get very familiar with them. And I, I actually invest quite a lot of time in conversations with people across the organization, not specifically about tone of voice, but just how long have you worked here? What do you do? What's the day to day? Like, you know, just very conversational. I often try and find a day or two where I can go in. It was a bit harder, obviously, in a post lockdown uh, working from home kind of environment. But yeah, just whether it's in real life or over Zoom or something, just chatting to people. And so I, I'll try myself to get quite a good feel for the organization because um, there is something really to be said for that external objective perspective yeah. that you're sort of hearing what they tell you but you're also hearing what they you're reading between the lines you're hearing what they're not telling you and so there's I always find that very interesting and then um we'll always have some kind of workshop um and the real thing there is is actually just talk you know talking about that discussing that together what sort of organizational personality do we think you have what are the things you really want and hope that people know and understand about you and we sort of talk that through and I usually find that my, my biggest role or my, the area in which that external perspective can be the most helpful is on on really pushing them because I think people nat naturally why would they that's not something they do every day people aren't particularly good at really uh, being specific and really articulating exactly what they mean so people will say oh we're just we're just really friendly we're, we're just like a really nice place to work and so it's my job to sort of push on that and say okay well can you help me understand like when you say friendly can you think of an example like is there anyone in the room who you think particularly personifies that kind of is it friendliness because um they you can tell that they really care is it friendliness because they're warm and bubbly is it you know you, you just got to push on all of those to try and and when they say you know always comes up we're just we're really professional we're just we're so professional like, okay but what like what do you mean do you mean is that to do with knowledge and expertise? Is it to do with needing people to to trust you? Is it to do and just really pushing on those? I, I tend to find that that is the biggest part that I play in that process because I'm not I'm it's not for me to tell them who they are. It's me trying to help them find out and and sort of pull out. You know, you as an organisation might be a hundred things, but which ones are the most significant and important? And then how do we get as specific as possible about those? So there's a, I'm I'm sort of the the unearther and the shaper. Yeah, no, it, it reminds me of, we've, we've been talking a lot about show, don't tell recently. It's classic, boring, like uh, off too often peddled advice, but you, you said the word tell there and you kind of were circling around the idea that rather than just telling people we are professional, we are, um, we are yeah. funny, we are kind or whatever, or we are good at, for customers, it's you're, what you're doing is unearthing, giving them an opportunity to reflect back on them and by getting them to show you how is how are you done that? Well, what do you mean when you say that? What you really say is, well, show me an example of that. Rather than just saying, we are this, it's about trying to like unearth those things of those examples that show that you can just point to and go, well, we give all of our customers a cookie when they arrive. Um, I don't know yeah. why I'm thinking of the Double Tree by Hilton. They, uh, yeah. I don't know if they still do, but I can remember getting a cookie at that hotel. I was like, all right. Yeah. But that's showing me an example of like, oh no, we we give cookies away. That's a thing. It's like, oh right, that's that's quite friendly, isn't it? It's like, yeah, but it shows we it's friendly rather than just saying we are a friendly company, a friendly brand. So that, that's really interesting. So so you, you, you're going in, obviously, the it kind of, it's common sense. You, you've got to dig deep um, like you would with any uh, form of research. You, you're trying to figure out what's going on, get get them to, to show them show themselves what they really think, uh, which is key. Um, but once you've got that, um, and I, 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 I mentioned it before, I saw a great thing you've done on LinkedIn, where you've given three examples of a company called Headspace, which is, uh, for those who don't know, it's, well, I'm not sure I fully know, but I think it's a, it's like a, um, 
mental health, an app, mental health. Yeah, it's like a mental health app, but not just mental health. It's just like a, almost like you can meditation. To, meditation. Well, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, and that's the, you had very small paragraph, but it said the the options were it's, let's say we it's uh, the about us and it's saying we're your best buddy, we're your best friend or your best pal, I think it was. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, that's cheeky. I was like, what, what could it be? I'm not 100% sure. I was like, buddy, like, feels a bit American and a bit, like, too over-familiar. I was like, best friend feels, felt a little bit kind of dull, but I was like, but that feels, like, real and authentic, I guess. Um, and then pal was like yeah not pal that's a bit kind of weird uh, i saw someone said it reminded them of dogs uh, in the uh, in the comments yeah. but anyway I, I went away and i thought right well i'm not waiting for your poll and your engagement play there which is fine but yeah i thought right i'm going to have so i'm looking on the headspace i'm thinking right okay where is it and i found it and it oh i won't reveal it in case uh, you've not you know, this thing but the answer actually I've, I've got to to explain but it was the answer's best friend that was the the thing rather than buddy or pal and i thought well that's that's interesting because i thought yeah, it's a bit kind of straight if anything it's a bit kind of run the mill from a copy perspective if you're trying to like really get something but at the same time it speaks openly within that sentence structure it's natural it feels authentic it's not too um like uh silly it's not too dull it's just right that's one small word but I, I thought that's it gives a great example. It shows you a, a great example of how when you understand the tone of uh, the, the, the brand that you're trying to speak to, you wouldn't say buddy, you wouldn't say pal. All of that comes out of that. That's the kind of why we do this. But I just wondered, could you speak to why you think for that company, for that, spe- how would you get from unearthing what they want to be to that literally in the the words kind of thing what's the the next bit to connect those two um assuming kind of after, after doing that initial kind of mining piece then how do you get to actually develop sure, yeah. language and um to be honest it's both well it's simple but it's not easy <laughs> um in that it, it's just writing a lot of writing um i think that's that's kind of the other thing that i sometimes see um with and I hope I'm not going to sort of step on any toes but some I I do see more and more copywriters sort of beginning to uh, not exactly transition but to offer some kind of tone of voice toolkit a bit of tone of voice help alongside the copywriting work which is I mean I think it's great that that's becoming more well known but one thing I do see quite often is people just jumping quite quickly to the sort of like creating a toolkit, creating a guide, create, you know, sort of your brand voice guidelines. They just, you know, they pick their four adjectives and a little bit of explanation and kind of bam. And I, I think often there's a, there's just a process in the middle, which is sort of not very sexy and not very tangible and, and so hard to talk about and sell, but it, it's just a lot of writing. It's, you know, you've, you've said to yourself, okay, so we think we are this, this, and that, you know, we've got our, three or four or five adjectives or whatever things we think are really important for people to know and understand about us but there even within that there is still room for some interpretation I think you have you have to feel your way into it I know there are some different differences of opinion about this and some people are not really happy with it can be a bit of a nebulous kind of process but I yeah I think a lot of it it's it's a little bit subjective so everyone will approach it slightly differently but I think you've got to spend a lot of time writing and just just having a go and saying okay I've I've written it like this. If I read that and I didn't know anything about it, would that make me feel this way about the company or that way about the company? And you you have to do that kind of almost sometimes word by word. Sometimes I'll write something and think, well, it's just not quite right. And I'll spend like a further hour and then I'll just realize it was one word and then I'll change it. And I'll be like, yes, that's the, because it sometimes can be as simple as that, but things together except for one, well, because every word has a particular connotation or gets used more or less in a certain context or, you know, that's obviously I'm speaking to uh, copywriters and preaching to the choir, the importance and the significance of words. And so I think it's just recognizing there isn't there isn't one magical set of better words. It just totally depends what fits right in the context, what best. Yeah, of I, I guess what you're doing, because I, I know what you mean about that 
um, speaking from personal experience, I get uh, briefs where I've got like the tone of voice guide and it's like the three words, almost always friendly, professional, and then in insert other adjective that they decided for this particular brand kind of thing. And then there's an explanation of what that means. It's never an explanation of what it means for the company uh, mm. or the brand. It's what it means, i.e. the concept of friendliness. And it's, well, I always think, well, that's, this is just irrelevant. What I can see though, if, if you do the work, if you actually got, uh, let's say you had a little tone of voice guide that really you'd done the first work, you you dug down, you'd understood what they're, um, they're, they're showing you, that you've found a really good way of explaining that, of of giving examples of that, and, and there's lines and stuff. I, I remember um, I, I always liked something, I think it was Vicky Ross who uh, gave me this tip, but it was finding like a celebrity that represents that company. And that was like, oh, that's quite a visual way of seeing that. And I can now I'm in a space where I can actually start to imagine what that might look like mm. what i'm doing is narrowing all the time and i can see where if you narrowed it down and got it to a very good thing then once you've got that clear uh, guide you've got a smaller word to do the work in like so that's the thing as a copywriter if, if you just go right here's the client let's say hsbc is a bank um and you go right cool what words do I use to like write this? You've got yeah. every word in the world that could be yeah. be there for hours. However, if you do this work and go, right, well, this this particular bank is um, serious, blah, 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 and you get those things and you go all the way. What you're doing is narrowing to the point where you can go, right, well, I think they are friendly, but it won't be friendly. It'll be more descriptive and more interesting uh, version of that. But it's narrowing it down. But then crucially... And I think I'm glad, well, I don't know, I, I know people on, I feel, my gut feeling is I know people on both sides of uh, these these wars, but I feel that even given that, once you've narrowed it down, there's still so much work to do within the, the actual writing space to like figure that out. But what you've done is narrowed it down to go, well, I'm in this room, I'm in, I'm in this area, this zone of language. What I'm interested to know is once you've gone through that process, do you provide clients with a, a guide thing? and how much do you in that writing process refer back to, do you go all the way back to the start of what you've done or are you trying to in that narrowing at some point get a guide that you might go, okay, for this particular client, this is where we, the, the, the room we're in and these are the bound, the, the parameters of that room. Do you have that or is it all from the rough stuff or how do you, um, just, just yeah, get back. Yeah. Um, yeah I, so I I do always include some element of I I do tend to use the phrase like to, toolkit more than like a guide or guidelines mainly just because no one likes guidelines they sound really boring <laughs> um <laughs> want people to actually use it um but I I am always saying to clients it offers the the toolkit the guide bit is what they sort of cling onto because it's like the tangible sort of output but I always say to clients that it's I think it's the weakest tool in your arsenal or weapon in your arsenal mixing my metaphors there um but it's so I think it's useful and I I do do a, a lot of that so looking at what what is the personality that we want to evoke and so therefore what does that look like and what does that mean I tend to try and focus a lot on examples so I do quite a lot of sort of this is how we used to say this this is how we say it now and here's why I, I think that is often more helpful to people than a literal set of rules but there is often good good amounts of stuff about vocabulary and you know, like the, the sort of friendly example you were saying and even the like friend pal buddy thing so then you know there might be some brands who are super super friendly in that kind of we your bff sort of space and you know i'm thinking of like some period brands that are like hey we've got your back babes you know and that is personally I hate it but it but that can work really well for yeah. the right brand for the right audience and so it's knowing when we say friendly are we babes or are we friendly in a polite more sort of distance kind of way and are we friendly like hey buddy you know hey dude we're camping together and it's that kind of brand or is it you know we're your friend we're here for you quietly supportive you know there's so that we there's definitely some plenty of room for examples with vocabulary 
um I tend to steer away from like never say this or don't where possible because I think that's not always helpful but just examples and stuff like that but the the bigger thing really is often around um kind of trait like training people and even that I don't I don't really like that word but introducing people to the voice and having some interactive sessions where you sort of practice it and you work through examples together and you sit and, and write together and I've definitely found with clients that is what makes it come alive for people and what makes it stick more than like here's a 10 page pdf everybody loves the, the, the toolkit stuff I think is more of a kind of referral you want to sort of embed it with people and then yeah. and then they write something and then they go oh I, I can't quite remember what they said about x or I, I'll just double check about why and you know then they can kind of refer back to the toolkit but it it shouldn't be a sort of like no one writes well like from a list of rules in front of them that's that's never inspired great writing no it's, so. it's really it, what you're talking about again without being too tweet is is the showing the, the examples that's the hardest part I find and I, and I can tell that's why a lot of people wouldn't do or would rely on the only the pdf that has the three things that explain it because yeah. to actually show it and to do the work and get the words and say well well what does that mean saying babes rather than uh, friend what where is the difference and why would you say that how is the example show me an example of that being used within a sentence is the harder bit to do but from the sounds of it that's where clients most in and go all right okay I can see how that is I can see why that is I can see why I would um think more about this because it is it, it it's obvious stuff and it's almost simple but it's it sh it shows it evidences it and it shows you to the client oh actually I didn't realize that was as subtle as that that's the change that's why we're doing this because once you're narrowing down you can get to an, a sentence that says hey babes and know that that connects directly with your customer and you go that's a brilliant connection whereas if you're just still so wide and, and nebulous in the world of copy any light might kind of get someone and you're not really speaking to your audience very well so I can see but that's that's hard work that's presumably where you're spending the time and that's that's yeah. uh that's the, the the rub if you like yeah and I, I do suppose that's if almost if I'm like oh I'm taking my moment because I've got an audience of copywriters or whatever I suppose that is the one thing that I probably almost would want to be allowed to say to copywriters of the world if if I can and if I can without just sounding like a bitch, there we are. Say it. Be names. Preach. Be names. Preach. <laughs> um, so I, I do think there is a tendency to think of tone of voice stuff as a sort of natural partner to copywriting stuff. And, you know, if you're a copywriter, then you can do tone of voice stuff. And obviously they're related. And clearly for me, one career sort of grew out of the other. And um, I, yeah, obviously they are related, but I... I will say it's been quite interesting as brown boy stuff has become more recognized seeing the proliferation of copywriters who are kind of offering a little bit of a tone of voice sort of package alongside copywriting stuff and I, I suppose I would just say to people just be a bit wary of that I think if you're working with quite small clients with you know small budgets and then I I, I can see that that makes more sense but I think it's just a bit of wariness of actually not from a perspective of, of like, get off my turf, not at all, like, flipping it, there's millions of companies out there and they all need help, like, come onto my turf, great, like, focus on brand voice stuff, that would be brilliant. Um, but I, almost more for you as copywriters, like, don't bite off more than you can chew, don't try and offer them more than you could, because actually really developing tone of voice stuff, it is, it's hard and it's a, a lot of work. And, you know, my projects are all kind of different, but I normally work... I don't have any retained work. I just do it on a project basis. So go in, help them develop, train them, leave them with the toolkit and then kind of come out. But most of my projects are at least three or four months. I've got one client at the moment where we'll probably finish working together in the autumn, by which point we'll be working together for a year. It's, you know, it's totally different and size and scale. It depends on the business, but it's, it's not, it's not just like, oh, let's spend an afternoon and we'll tackle it. it you know, so it's almost like for you as a copywriter, don't, it's really important, but don't, overcommit don't see it as just like a tiny little add-on that you can do as part of the job because that won't serve the client and it really won't serve you mm. that's my preach over yeah, no I, I think it's um it's one of those things where I, I can see what you mean I can see where it, it's oh we can do that and, and sort that out for you quick I, I, do you know what I've probably been 
guilty of it uh, maybe not because that's from an agency point of view where I've, I've represented something bigger so i'm giving that a a bit more of its thing, but I can certainly see a, an idea where a copywriter, especially like on a freelance basis, would be like, "Oh, we can do this. I, oh, I can do that. Yeah, that's that's the buzzword that you've asked for." I think it's almost like reverse niching or something. But it's you could yeah. you can buy if you're going to do it properly. If you just go and like, even if you're the best copywriter in the world and you you write ace copy, but then you like say, oh, and here's your supportive thing. It says I'm friendly thing. It's just not going to reflect well on you because another a tone of voice expert or a strategist or someone who's who's dedicated to that is going to come in and go, who wrote this? What's going on here? And they're going to go, well, oh, we the copyright we used did that. And I go, no, this is nonsense. And that's going to undermine the copywriter. Whereas mm -hmm. if you've got a good designer, a good tone of voice person, a good uh, words person who can then riff and work with a um, a company that's been prepped, as you say, in, by someone who's gone in, done the work, given examples, shown what it looks like. Then a copywriter, I can take that and go, right, I've got you. I know exactly what this looks like. I can now work within this uh, space. I can fill in these words. I can do that. The more information I have in those situations, again, speaking from experience, if I know, all right, okay, we're going all the way. Like, cool, yeah. I can see the examples. I can write to that. If you yeah. just kind of said friendly and professional, I'm like, okay, well, I'll do what I think you mean by that because I think you mean you want it to look like innocent or whatever kind of thing. But they're like, oh, no, actually, we meant this. And it's like, well, you only gave me one option. So I can see why it's it's a dangerous thing to try and do all of that at once um, well, and because you know flipping it the other way around like i i don't see myself at all as replacing a copywriter i i have a great network of brilliant copywriters that i rely on and refer people to all the time because i see that i i come in and do the initial piece of work and and the primary use really for a lot of a lot of that work and of the toolkit stuff specifically is to provide a really helpful brief and a base for a professional copywriter. It depends. I mean, sometimes companies are big enough, they have kind of in-house writers, but yeah, where they're using freelancers, I would see my work as kind of setting up a, co a copywriter to succeed. And so that's where sometimes the, the danger is that if you're taking on too much as a copywriter, you are not only doing the client and yourself a disservice, but you're possibly doing a disservice to the next copywriter that comes along and it, it's sort of worse almost than having nothing because you've given them something and they think the box has been ticked, but actually it hasn't quite been ticked in an actually helpful way. And so that's almost sort of worse than yeah. <laughs> nothing at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. The takeaway, I guess, is um, think, don't try to like do everything yourself because um, then it will end up being or seeming like bullshit. You are basically going to do a little bit of it rather than the actual proper work you, you need to do the proper work um you can't just go it's professional it's friendly but where you go you've got a tone of voice you have to dig down and go back to like source and, and do that work and give examples yeah but it, there's also maybe a sort of freedom in like a permission giving of that you might feel as a copywriter that because tone of voice stuff is so intrinsically to do with words that if a client asks you to do it that you sh you should be able to say yes like that should be within my remit as a copywriter and I suppose I don't know if it helps at all I'm here to tell you that that's yeah. that doesn't have to that's not true it, it might well be within your remit and your skill set but it, it might not be and that's valid that doesn't mean you're not a great copywriter it took me quite a long time to transition from being a copywriter to doing brand boy stuff and certainly to doing it at, at the level and the depth that I'm doing it now and so it's I, it's not a, a given that because you're a copywriter you should be able to do the tone of voice stuff so don't feel like you have to say yes or you yeah. should be able to do it that's yeah that isn't true I'm gonna go away and just throw out every search for tone of voice in my inbox and just say no i'm not doing it I'm not doing it much. Uh, but yeah no that's brilliant thanks very much um beth i uh i think we've covered a load of weird like angles and stuff there but I, th I, I it's really interesting i i think this it's a subject i think is so dangerous out there there's so many different voices and so many um uh people talking about it and having their two pence worth and saying oh this is what you should do you should do this you should do this i'm guilty of saying you should in in this myself but the the truth is you 
it's a really powerful tool um, if you when you see it in practice and when you see it done really well. And I, I've seen that myself when I go, oh, that's a really good line or a really good way of expressing that. And it might not necessarily be from the copy writer's mind, but some it's because someone has done the work to identify what really does set that brand aside. And and as you say, that's sometimes it's there's a massive crossover, but sometimes that's not just through copy, that's through doing that specific work. It's a great thing for copywriters to be aware of in the same way I'd suggest copywriters learn about design, they should learn about customer service, they should learn about business management, they should learn about marketing, they should have all of these um, across the top of the T kind of thing, but you are a, a writer ultimately. Um, so be aware of it, but don't try and like bite off more you can chew. Um, cool, we'll end it there, Beth. Thanks very much for your time. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, I will share links uh, below this to go and find uh, out more about uh, Beth. Um, at bethanyjoy.co.uk is the uh, official I might have said com I'm not sure if you've uh, registered that whether uh, you've got the com and the thing or the dot online and all whatever is available these days but I will put the official link uh, in or around this video um, go check uh, Bethany out uh, add her on LinkedIn and um, any comments below uh, any thoughts on branding if we've said something that's evil and against everything you believe about brand voice please start an argument below. I would love nothing more than that. Uh, and Bethany will uh, come and defend herself uh, from uh, her preaching, saying that you shouldn't do it as a copywriter. What a disgusting. How dare you say such things? But no, thank you very much, Bethany. And uh, thank you for watching. See you soon. If you enjoy The Fix and want to get access to even more good stuff, join The Fix Accelerator today. Get access to special masterclasses from Nick and me, watch expert interviews with industry legends, join live copy feedback sessions every week, and get connected to our very own private copy network. Visit thefixaccelerator.com for more information.